Good evening and Yali Medet. Welcome to Summer Reflections, our weekly summer series where we look back on some of our best interviews, insightful moments, and share some of our never before seen pieces. Tonight, we're going to revisit my conversation with Bruno Freski on the Smiley Center Vancouver in a program entitled Insights from the Architect. Bruno shares his experience working with Malana Hazrima and his approach to designing a Jamath Khanna. I hope you enjoy the program. In Islam, man is answerable to God for whatever he has created, and this is reflected in its architectural heritage. Many of the greatest architectural achievements in Islam were designed to reflect the promises of the life hereafter, to represent in this world what we are told of the next. Since all that we see and do resonates on the faith, the aesthetics of the environment we build and the quality of the social interactions that take place within these environments reverberate on our spiritual life. It is with this in mind that the Burnaby Jamatkana has been conceived. A great deal of work and thought has gone into the planning and design of the building that will rise on this site. The underlying objective has been to develop a religious and social facility for the local Ismaili community which, while blending harmoniously and discreetly with the surrounding environment and making full use of materials indigenous to the area, will still reflect an Islamic mood and add yet another dimension to the varied architecture of the Lower Mainland. The challenge has been unusual and I feel that it is one which has been successfully met by the prominent Vancouver architect, Mr. Bruno Freski. Mr. Freski is in a way symbolic of the strengths that come from the very diversity of the Canadian way of life. Born a Canadian citizen, he comes from an Italian Catholic background. He has the professional quality and personal sensitivity to create in highly typified cross-cultural situations, having already designed a Sikh Gurudwara before this beautiful Ismaili Jamaat Khanna. Because of our traditional concern with our environment and the impact it has on us and on others, we have sought that this building should enhance the aesthetic quality of life in the neighborhood. The new building will stand in strongly landscaped surroundings. It will face a courtyard with fountains and a garden. Its scale, its proportions, and the use of water will serve to create a serene and contemplative environment. This will be a place of congregation, of order, of peace, of prayer, of hope, of humility. It is my hope, a very deep hope, that it will become a symbol of a growing understanding in the West of the real meaning of Islam. This will be a place of congregation, of order, of peace, 
of prayer, of hope, of humility. Welcome to Sundays at the Smiley Center Visionary Voices. My name is Zara Premji and it's an absolute honor to be here with you today. This is the third event in the Smiley Center Vancouver 35th Anniversary Series. So far, we've been able to hear from former Canadian Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, former Smiley Council for Canada President Farouk Virji, as well as former President for Council for BC, Badr Kareem. They've allowed us to have a lot of insight into the history of the Smiley Center of Vancouver, as well as to remember so many of those milestones that the space and many of us have been able to be a part of. Now, it's exciting for me to tell you that today we're going to get a tour of the Smiley Center Vancouver by the very man who designed it, Bruno Freschi. Bruno is a Canadian architect and officer of the Order of Canada. He's best known for his role as the chief architect for Expo 86 in Vancouver. Also, some of his most notable work includes the Science World in Vancouver and the Smiley Center Vancouver, of course, and the Staples Residence in Vancouver. Now, in tonight's program, we will start with Bruno telling us in his own words about his personal journey with creating the magnificent space that we all know as the Smiley Center Vancouver. He will then walk us through his key insights, his inspirations, his conversations with so many mentors and how he materialized his vision alongside His Highness's vision and created this space and this community that we know so well 35 years later. Then we're going to come back from my most exciting favorite part of today. I'm going to be able to ask Bruno so many questions that I imagine are on many of our minds. So please enjoy the presentation. What I've found, having done a thousand tours, once people hear this, they go in and then I catch them rubbing the wood or, you know, they're trying to touch it, trying to find what all this means. You know, why isn't this legible? And I have to explain that ambiguity gives birth to curiosity and curiosity gives birth to spirituality. In essence, this story starts with a very, with a funny beginning because my secretary said, there's somebody that's insisting that I speak with you. We would like you to consider doing a building for His Highness, the Aga Khan. We want you to meet His Highness and uh, he of course has the final call. Next thing I know, I was in Paris. <laughs> and that was really quite an exciting meeting because his Highness is a, has a profound understanding of architecture and uh, very, very few clients in the world are prepared to talk about spiritual space, the meaning of design, the process of design. And I discovered uh, a soulmate in His Highness. Are the subjects of which we talked about for sacred space and the fusion of contemporary and historical architecture and how to achieve an expression for a new community in Canada. And that became a touchstone for the whole project. We were talking about a building and a garden or if you like, an earthly paradise. Uh, 
as the first Jomakana in North America, it carried the responsibility to become a symbol in and of itself. The Jomakana did achieve that quality, but that was a stated first principle. The second was that as a landmark, it was to be iconic. And the point of talking about symbolism and iconic qualities is that it has to relate to generations yet to be born, to capture the quality, to celebrate the pluralism. And for a new community, uh, what could be more exemplary under the word pluralism? It also had to welcome and celebrate many other communities in Canada, known and yet unknown. It's multi-generational, timeless in its quality. But this building had to be a fusion of Ismaili historical character, Islamic historical character, and contemporary Canadian environment. So that leads us to the real conceptual phase that in spiritual architecture, one goes in to go out. Really what it means is that we go into the building, go there for spiritual purposes. The building must achieve a quality that you can leave behind. So you go in to literally and spiritually go out. That was a principle. So first, create beauty. Everything was about beauty. But to that idea, enables one to enter the realm of spirituality. It frees you up. In that sense, you need the building to get that, but then you don't need the building anymore because you're free of the building. And so another principle was touching the earth lightly. I'm borrowing that from somebody else, but it really means that you, when you take a place, you build a building, do a garden, that you leave it better than the way you found it, whatever that place is. And some of the Islamic influence in all of this is another phrase of mine, the relentless pursuit of geometry to achieve perfection. But in essence, it's the completion. You go into geometry, it's another language. Geometry is a much more profound subject and it becomes indelibly printed in all of us. And we went through a holistic geometric integration throughout the entire building to achieve the harmony that in fact it has, both the building and the site. And so it must be a fusion, an integration, a timeless of timeless aesthetic principles. To understand the Jamatkana architecturally is to see it as a book and, and also see it as a play. You know, when the lights go out, your mind turns off, and then you are free in your imagination. And the great playwright captures your imagination and away you go. You're, you're in the play. And that this narrative of the site begins as you turn off Curl Avenue and you come in and there is this confusing point of entry. Do I go left or do I go right? Confusion gives birth to question. And that momentary perception, decision, is your welcome to the site. And that happens throughout the building. You can come from the left or the right, from one corner or another corner, you're always on an axis. 
without being on the axis. The octagon, the magic of the octagon. If you put them together, they nest together and leave a square between them. This octagonal geometry infused throughout the building. Now the octagon simply is the midpoint between the circle and the square. And that holds the base of the dome together. And, but a circle, domes or circles, must come down to straight walls. And so the squaring of the circle has been part of the mystery of the development of the past 7,000 years of architecture. And Islamic architecture has accomplished that most eloquently. If you look up in the ceiling of the prayer hall, you see the complete octagon, but half of the octagon is over the main entrance of the Jamakana. All the paving in the courtyard is an octagonal grid. Only even the small medallions that are in the wood screens, the brass medallions. We tried to even create that patterning in a tactile sense in the carpet, in the prayer hall. So we carved the pattern uh, into the carpet so you feel it, but visually it's everywhere and architecturally it's in the primary structure. It becomes the thing that ties the whole building together. Earlier I talked about the principle of this indelible, symbolic, iconic presence of a building for a new community. And so I decided that all the materials would be of the earth. And to celebrate that, that gave birth to the concrete, it gave birth to the sandstone, and the various uses of glass uh, in the building. We were able to, to celebrate materials which are very permanent and we were able to clad the entire exterior and paint the octagonal pattern in the courtyard uh, with sandstone is even more beautiful in the rain than when it's dry, than less beautiful when it rains in Vancouver. The next element I want to talk about is light. In a spiritual building, uh, one has to capture light but more importantly, you have to celebrate light. So those large windows are really not windows at all. They're lanterns. So we put the glass out in the light and so it glows inward and then gives contrast for the iconography, which is on the glass. At the lower faces of that piece that protrudes out, it slopes 45 degrees. And, and we fired the iconography on both sides of the glass. The aberration between the inside print and the outside print on an inch thick glass vibrates visually. At nighttime, when the artificial lighting is on on the interior, looking up, the light glows gold. This is really the celebration of light, celebrating something which is extremely important and permanent in our architectural environment and that Islamic architecture historically has really consistently awakened us to the surface of buildings and the iconography does one thing it celebrates those surfaces and therein you see the graphic material that, was, that is put on the glass, the tile work in the main prayer hall, throughout the building. Within that realm, I'll speak again about the carpet. It's held back from the edge as a wood perimeter, but rather it's an element. It is the earth in the prayer hall. So the wood screens have a wood base. And then looking up, there are domes. They have skylights, uh, so the light coming through has a golden hue to it. 
So each octagon has a skylight uh, in the center. And very important principle that being in the prayer hall, there is no center. So wherever you are in the prayer hall, you're in the center. That gave birth to the multiplicity of domes that every person is in his or her own center in the room. There is no center spot. As you walk through the building, if you approach an octagon, there isn't a central axis. You're always in the center. And it's a celebration of the individual, spiritually speaking, in the space. And so those ideas really have generated the entire building and to create a singular spiritual experience that you can leave behind. I honestly can say this, there's nothing about it that I would change and there's nothing about it I would correct. And I love all of it and I always have uh, and you don't achieve spirituality without completion. Well, this is the closest thing I know to a holistic architecture. It's 100%. All right, Bruno, thank you so much for that really insightful tour. I learned a lot from it. You know, I've been in this space for 31 years. I've been utilizing this beauty that you have created for us. So thank you so much for walking us through that. And the obvious next part, I have a lot of questions for you. I've had a lot of questions every time I've walked in and now I get to actually ask them to you. So bear with me because I have a lot. <laughs> so, you know, I really first off want to start off with asking you, Bruno, what was it like to be there with the Aga Khan and having his insight? What extent of insight and direction did he give you when you were building this space? Well, the um, that's really one of the most important pieces of this whole story. But firstly, let me just say that uh, I just want to recognize all the staff in my office that worked on the building and consultants who helped me. There's a lot of people. I talked to consulting with a lot of people and um, they all were incredibly helpful. And my staff was just magnificent through the whole, I guess it took about five years, five years of work. Uh, but coming back to, to your question, um, uh, when I was invited to Paris after the appointment, we had, I think it was two or three different sessions um, with his highness, which were very personal, very direct. And he had just begun this large global project of building the Jamankana. And he had completed the London Jamankana. Uh, so we toured that. But what I discovered was uh, that his highness has an architectural gene. And he is, in fact, I call him an architect. Uh, he denies it, but anyway, um, I thought he was very, very, very receptive and very responsive to uh, the idea, all the big ideas that we were trying to talk about. You can't talk about these with anybody. You got to, you got to be there. Um, and so those ideas were central to the whole conceptual of the building. And he was a, a really a magnificent client in that sense. Um, the most important uh, dimensions, which I had mentioned earlier, uh, were the conversations we had around sacred space, something that's not understood by a lot of people, but what every religious building should try to achieve. And uh, I think in a sense, what's clear, we shared this concept of getting to a complete architectural statement to achieve that. Then the fusion of uh, contemporary architecture and historic architecture, something that belittles many projects and inspires many projects. And uh, we tried to create or achieve that fusion. Um, 
And one of the most important things was uh, that at that time, the Ismaili community was relatively new to Canada as a result of the historic story. Um, <clears throat> and this building represented the first permanent major foundation piece of the Ismaili community in Canada. And really, he strongly reinforced that. So the building had to achieve this iconic character of being a foundation. And that was a primary objective of it. And then what most people in this world don't realize is many buildings are passing fantasies. Uh, they are built and they're torn down, etc. This was seen to be a lasting, permanent legacy that generations, multiple generations could identify with. And I'm so happy you're one of those people who uh, is a younger generation, but today has grown up and lived with it. And then the final piece was my own research that I had done a lot of travel. I've been involved with sacred spaces uh, and other religious uh, organizations. And it was really exposing my travel and knowledge of that. And uh, we in effect um, sort of said, you know, those are the primary objectives of it. Very unusual, but very, very inspiring for me, the architect for it. You know, you mentioned that, of course, I'm one of those generations that you've impacted by building this space. Bruno, for you to not be a part of the religion and entering for this for the prayer aspect of it, but to know that you've given us this foundation, what does that mean to you to know 35 years later, we are utilizing this space, we are honored to walk into it, and it is something that you are part of giving us? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say this as humbly as I can. <laughs> I'm very proud of that fact. But um, architecture is autonomous. Um, the nature of space, architectural space, is in itself a reality. And therefore, I have never participated in a religious ceremony in the building, and nor do I have to. That sacred space is an autonomous thing of which you bring a belief to. I don't deliver the belief. And that's a very, very important thing. So my job was to try to capture the nature of sacred space. Your job was to go in, to go out, as I say in my, in my notes. Uh, and that became the kind of architectural mission. And uh, just a plug for architecture, that architecture has to be understood as autonomous. That most things are related to most things, but architecture is a unique, three-dimensional physical experience, which you bring the fourth dimension, time and your perception and your transitions in using it. I don't do that, you do that. So we sort of have a partnership that way. Well, I'm really glad I get to meet my partner finally then. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you have had the privilege of working with His Highness that you've just spoken about. I've never heard the word architect used for him. I've heard many wonderful words used for His Highness, but architect. What was it like working with His Highness? Um, with, with many sessions, um, you know, I would arrive with a bunch of drawings and little models and things, and they'd all be pulled apart and destroyed. Uh, he's a very, very insightful critic. Um, and he's a very, very generous, creatively generous person. So that critiques were not critiques of the work. There are many things wrong. And in terms of the overall project, working with him was always a, actually a pleasure because even though, you know, it's the client and they, you want them to like what you're doing. And, and if he didn't like something, he would say so but in an open generative way. So we would open the door to pursuing other things. In fact, there's a little funny story here that I arrived one Friday and nobody told me it was a bank holiday in France and everything was closed down. And um, the landscape architect gave me his office. I was staying in an inn 
not too far from Eglamont. And um, I had the use of this office and I decided to redraw everything because uh, I had realized a few things. I mean, the procedure was that we'd work in Vancouver, I'd have drawings and models, pack it up, fly there. And before going, I'd go to Harvard to the Joint Center. They would critique it. We'd have the conversation. They then would tell X, those days were tell X, pre-email, pre, uh, e et cetera. And he would have a, sort of a review of the work before I arrived. And so it was a very knowledgeable, informed session. I got there, had this weekend to myself by surprise, and I thought I would just redraw the scheme because I realized I wanted to make some changes. And so we, I had this office in Eglamont, sat there and redrew the whole scheme. And it was on yellow paper with thick pencil uh, and very, very, these drawings were for me, not for anybody else. Lo and behold, he was there and he was trying to locate the sculpture in the courtyard because they were still finishing the courtyard at Eglamont. And the, the uh, person that was moving the plywood cut out of the sculpture, I could see him out there and he had put it in the wrong place. So I figured, he, I didn't know that His Highness was watching all this. So I went out, I went down and I told this guy, he was Italian, I could speak Italian to him to move it onto this axis. And then I look back and there's His Highness with the, with the binoculars in the, in the uh, building and he saw me. So he waved me in and said, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I didn't know it was a bank holiday. And I was busy, but I had graphite all over my hands. He said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm drawing. And he said, what are you drawing? And I said, changes. Uh, it's still evolving. And he was very good about that. So we went upstairs. He wanted to see the drawings. And I said, but they're not really drawn for you. They're, you know, he said, show me. So I showed him these yellow tracing paper on all these scribbles. And he said, sign them. So I signed them. He took them. <laughs> so there's a set of drawings that I've never seen again that he had. He really liked what I was doing. Um, and there's another complicated architectural side of it, but uh, I had changed, I developed that ma the major windows and I clarified the octagonal module for the whole building, but I really had to draw it. So I redrew everything again. And by, um, by mon Monday morning, I had a new scheme and put out in front of him and uh, it went over really well. He had a chance to look at the roughs. We could have a lot of questions. There were many questions. And of course, there's always arguments about budgets and things, but he understood where we were going with the building. It was a marvelous experience. So it sounds like your vision changed quite a bit as you were going through it, but I wanna ask, once you started constructing that actual building, did a lot of that vision change as well? Did a lot of change have to happen? No, you know, the drawings were 100, you can never say this about a building, but I can say this, about the Jamat Khan. When the drawings were complete, it was 100%. And he approved them and we changed nothing. Uh, we had built big full-scale models of the windows, which I call lanterns in Paris, so we could see what they were like. Found the glass manufacturer in Germany. Um, and then we had to you know, work with the graphics and the iconography. There are many of the details developed, but the basic conceptual work was 100%. And uh, once it was approved and signed off, nothing changed. And so, it was, and that's unusual because usually something's wrong. We got everything that was wrong. We got that out early. <laughs> so it went very well. You know, the Smiley Center is sort of this beautiful vision and multitude of architectural beauty. You take uh, contemporary Canadian architecture and beauty, and you also mix it with this historical Islamic aspect. You've won many awards for it, which is not surprising at all. Uh, what would you say is one of your favorite and most memorable awards to have won and why? 
Well, firstly, there are many, many awards, but none of them are formal because he did not want to have the building uh, to be put out for awards. Um, but there's been much, much written about it, and it's very, they've all been very good, very, very good critiques. For me, the most important thing of all is people like you. Uh, what I discovered was, and over the years with a thousand and one presentations that I've done there, that there are many people like you who are just babies who are not even born, and many young people, now they're old people. Uh, and I've met many of them, and they love it. So that I've actually lived through their appreciation of the building from children, and I've shown them how the corridor vibrates with the voices, the corridor downstairs. The ch kids love that. It was designed to do that. And I, when some somebody appreciates that and asks me, and they can see the vibes uh, in the little domes downstairs. They're just blown away. And I said, yeah, that's architecture. And so I take the many lessons in architecture, but the fact that it's multi-generational already, and hopefully many, many more uh, will enjoy it, is really the most significant pleasure, I can say, for me, the designer. Um, and the the incredible volunteer, the love of the building expressed through the volunteer work in the building is such a pleasure. In in this 21st century, you know, we we build buildings and we throw them away. I mean, there's just there's a lot of garbage. You know? <laughs> well, there's such a passion and love that it's such a thrill to see it. And I've met many of the people and somebody cleaning a carpet, um, you know, on their knees, they can then discover that I'm the architect and they're thrilled, you know. So the, from the simplest volunteer efforts through to the more complicated things, everybody has been such a pleasure to work with. It's an honor for the architect uh, to have that kind of care. You know, I can say uh, my 90 year old grandfather has never picked up a vacuum at home but he's one of those volunteers that goes in and wants to, to vacuum the carpet in the Smiley Center Vancouver because you've given him that space. So I know when you speak of that, it exists. <laughs> yeah. and it's a, he's done an excellent job. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let him know the triangles look good. You know, yeah. you've also, you've created a space for many of us, myself included, 31 years later, uh, I still walk in there every time and my breath is taken away. I've been to many of the other centers around the world, these smiley centers, but there's nothing like this particular one. And perhaps I'm biased because it's home, but there's something so beautiful about it that you sit there and I look up and I, I inspect where the light is coming in from, where it's not, where there are dark patches, where they're meant to be. You've given that to us. And I thank you for that. Something I've wanted to thank you for for 31 years, but I must ask, 35 years later, is there anything you would change about that space? No. <laughs> um, I, the, um, and it's very hard to say this about any building because you learn things when you build things. But um, see, part of creating sacred space for anybody is achieving that level of, of uh, identity so that you, the person seeking the ex sacred experience, go in to go out. That's a quote of mine. And I use it all the time because you, uh, you design the building, you design the room so that in effect, you can put it behind you so that you can have your personal spiritual experience. So that's a primary lesson in most sacred space in the world. And to a sense, in a sense, uh, the, the, this building has achieved that. I can say that humbly, that the building has achieved that through the fact that it's so consistent, so thorough, 1000% complete, and every detail is considered. And there's a, a respect 
for the user's perception and the complexity of that perception. Let me give you one example that, that is very, very funny. The entrance to the building from Curl Avenue, you come in that entrance and you can go left or right. And there's nothing to say left or right. And that's confusing. There's a huge argument at MIT uh, and at Harvard about this and a huge argument in Eglamont about it. So I had to argue for ambiguity. That is, it's the very nature of the ambiguity that enables you to pause and understand you're approaching something that is different than any place else. You're still in a car, you still have to park, you still have to figure out where to go, uh, but there's a degree of ambiguity that opens up personal space. And so often modern architecture is so blunt and so crude and so direct that it eliminates all ambiguity. But we are ambiguous beings and we need that space. So that's just one little example. There's thousands of other examples that I can go on about. On that, but that's one, one that everybody's experienced and a lot of people have very strong feelings about it as well. Some people think it's wrong, but it's not wrong. You know, when I normally enter, I pause, but I tend to go left and now I don't know why. So when I next yeah. go, I'm going to think about it and maybe go right, maybe do something different. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why I do this. Right, right. Yeah, I do the same thing. Yes, yeah, I, we, this is interesting. And I love that moment of pause that you're allowing us to have that yeah. for 31 years, I've never considered. Now I will. And, you know, I have to ask you, what are your hopes and visions for the future of the center? You've talked a lot about the past and how you built it up to where we are now. But what next? What do you hope for for the future? One of the really important things that's going on is uh, that I, to this day, if anything is to be touched or modified, they contact me and I go through it and I, I review things every month. Um, and so really nothing is to be changed. And, and I've been asked that question by everybody, including science, and no, there's no need for change, but there is need for maintenance and upgrading things. So there'll be small changes. And he's written the rule that nothing can be changed or modified without my permission. And that's really the first in my life. And I'm really honored by that but he honors the architecture and the architect in, contain, in maintaining that consistency. And so I really get to approve any, I mean, right now we're inst installing, uh, you know, heart defibrillators in the building because that's a new thing you have to have in public space. Well, I've designed the cabinet and the locations for them. Now that's an addition, You'll, you know, there it'll be in the building but they've got to be visible and they have to be available for emergencies, et cetera. So it's a very important thing, especially for very older people like me. And um, so there are technological modifications like that coming about. And we, I check every one. We meet, we figure locations. We just changed the air conditioning system because of the building is more crowded now and we upgraded that. I designed the metal screen for the new air conditioning cooler outside. Even little de new technological details, I'm still involved with it to maintain what I call the architectural integrity of the building, something that His Highness appreciates. And your community, unlike a lot of other communities, truly does appreciate that. They tell me that. So I'm very honored by that as well. You know, Bruno, I, I I have a list of questions I could sit over coffee and ask you forever once COVID is over, of course. Um, but I want to thank you. You know, you've given us this incredible space. And I know many of us have wanted to thank you. And I'm sure many are sitting down right now watching this and thanking you because you've given us something so beautiful and so special. And you continue to give more towards it in ways that we don't even know. For example, the, the defibrillators, the air conditioning, it is feeling better in there. So obviously you had a lot to do with that. <laughs> so honestly, thank you. Thank you for being a part of this cornerstone that has really been a massive part of us as an Ismaili community here in Vancouver, but I know worldwide as well. 
Thank you, Bruno. An absolute honor to chat with you today. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate what you said. Now I know I'm going to be entering the Smiley Center Vancouver with so much more in mind, especially the whole notion of going in to come out. Such beautiful moments that Bruno was able to express with us. But with that, I say thank you for watching. Thank you for joining us and for tuning in for this episode of Visionary Voices. Now, this was the third and final installment of the Smiley Center Vancouver Anniversary Series. We enjoyed being with you. We enjoyed having you celebrate 35 years of history, 35 years of joy and momentous occasions. Thank you for being with us. Now, remember to stay safe and stay happy. Mm -hmm.